Well, hello. Uh, my name is Richard Shefferson. I'm an associate professor at the University of Tokyo, and I'm the creator and maintainer of our package, Left Code 3. Uh, so thanks for your interest in the package. And I'll just go through a simple tutorial about it. Um, the first thing I would like to um, point your attention to actually, before we get into ourself, is how to find out some basic information about the package. If you um, Google three, a few things pop up. The most important is probably the CRAN repository page, which if you go to, um, the important thing here is that it tells you a little bit about the basic requirements. Basically, you need to be running R, at least version 3.5. Now, uh, the, this package has been tested on every pack, well, basically on R 3.6.3, as well as all the recent flavors of four, plus the development version currently, which is 4.1, and it works on all of them. It will not work on anything before 3.5, mostly because of some dependencies. Uh, so there are some packages that it relies on that uh, basically had severe overhauls right around R3.5. And so it will not work on versions before that. This page is also pretty useful because it gives you very quick access to the vignettes. The vignettes actually come with uh, the package itself, but you can access them quickly. So today I wanted to do the Cypripedium Candidum vignettes, the raw one, which you can um, load this way. and the function-based ones, which you can load this way, okay. Um, so let's go to R. Um, now, one thing that you'll notice is that I'm using R Studio for this. I recommend R Studio, it works very well. It helps you keep everything organized. I'm running this on the current um, main version of R, which is 4.0.3. This is being run on a Mac. And uh, when you first want to install Lefco 3, you can do, you can write, for example, install packages, uh, Lefco 3, and run that. It should in, um, ask you whether to install dependencies, please say yes. And then it should start to work. Alternatively, you can um, go into the install packages dialog box for our studio and just type in left code three. You'll see that it starts coming up automatically. It's on the repository after all. And you can install it. Now, the initial uh, example that I will give is with Cypripedium candidum. So this is a species that I've been studying for a long time, actually since 1994, I suppose it was. And so this is an orchid. It's a terrestrial orchid. It has a very bizarre life history. Um, and I could actually bring up, uh, well, uh, see the vignette for the, for the full history. But basically, it, it starts off life. You know, it, it starts from a dust seed. When it germinates, it germinates into what's known as a protocorn, which is a life stage that's non-photosynthetic. It basically lives in the, in the ground, parasitically living off of uh, fungi. And after a few years, it starts to sprout um, with small ephemeral leaves. They don't last very long until it becomes an adult. As an adult, um, it can stay underground and not sprout in any given year, or it can start putting up sprouts. The sprouts are usually non-flowering, but if they do flower, a single sprout has typically one flower, but sometimes two. And a single individual is rhizomatous, so it might have several sprouts on it. Okay. And so this data set is included um, in the um, R package, uh, LEFCO3. And what we have here are, is a data set um, that incorporates, and I think it says somewhere in here, does it not? Um, in any case, it's the years 2004 to 2009 from a census on um, this particular population of an endangered plant. So today, um, <clears throat> for this example, we're going to build raw matrices, and I will show you also a little bit about how to build uh, function-based matrices. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, uh, now, when you pull up uh, this vignette, you can pull it up, as I, meant, as I showed you a moment ago, you can copy and paste the blocks of code. And as we go, I'm just using the original file for this. Um, 
And if you have, if you want to access the vignettes through the package itself, you can type something like lefco3 into the help file, you know, click on any lefco3 function, go to the bottom of the help page to the index. And you'll see this is the index for the lefco3 help pages. If I click on user guides and vignettes, I see all of the vignettes over here. And I can go to chapter 3A, for example. This is the vignette, and I can pull it out into a special little box showing me. This is the full life history, but for the function-based model, we're using a simpler one this time uh, because we're dealing with raw matrices. And I'll show you how that goes. Um, but you can see basically all of the output here okay, as it comes out. OK. So the first thing we're going to do is wipe the memory, load LeftCo3, and then load the data set. And that's what's going to run over here. Now, the data set over here. Um, it's called SIP data, and let me show you the structure. So the way I have a tendency to make demographic data sets is that I use what's known as a horizontal structure to them. So each individual has all of its data in a single row. So there are, you know, if we go across rows, we'll never see the same individual again. So this has this is data for 2004, then 2005, 2006, 2007 on. You'll notice that if you're using this kind of structure, you actually need to have a pattern to how the variables are arranged. So here we have double flowered sprouts, single flowered sprouts, no flowered sprouts, and then we have the number of fruits. And then we go to the next year, same order, double flowered sprouts, single flowered sprouts, um, no flowered sprouts, fruits. On down the line, there's no extra you know, columns between them. If you wanna stick a blank column between them, you can, but then you have to put it between um, in the same place, basically within each group, uh, your group. Notice that these are all numeric. So all of these sorts of variables need to be numeric. Do not mix text or weird characters in there and make it all numeric or just blank. The only things that can be something else are, for example, the plant ID or so the individual identity or the patch or the population and so forth. This is horizontal data. You don't have to format it this way, but this is just how I do it. And I will show you how to work with this as well as a, a different style in just a moment. Because we have that data set, one important thing to recognize is that size is actually broken up into a few different variables there. Our, our total size will be the number of sprouts per individual. And the number of sprouts here winds up being the sum of the double flowered, single flowered, and no flowered sprouts in each case. So we create these new columns here. We can take a look at the density here. Okay. Now, in this case, just so, just in case you're wondering, so this, these are special vectors that we've done, and the only reason I created them is so that we can actually plot what size looks like. Okay. So this is a density dis distribution for uh, a density plot for size, but within our data set, we don't actually have to do that. We can have uh, Lefko three figure out the overall size for us. The first thing that we need to do is we need to input our life history uh, model. We do that by creating what's known as a stage frame. Uh, that's created with the function SF create. The stage frame will basically list important characteristics of each life history stage. And in this case, these are the life stages that we're creating, a dormant seed stage, protocorm one, two, and three stage, seedling stage. And the adult stages are dormant, extra small, small, medium, large, extra large. These vectors are in the same order, so describing some different variable for each of these cases. I'm just going to run this, and then I'm also going to run this because this is a part of the stage frame, and then I'll show you what it looks like. So frame raw is what it looks like. So you can see at the bottom here, this is the name of each stage. It gives you the size if one is given. So the size of zero generally means that it's not observed. The reproductive status, so obviously, if, um, if you're a juvenile or a non-reproductive adult, this is going to be zero. Observation status, in the case of a plant, this generally means whether or not it's sprouting. If it's not sprouting, then you can't observe it. Propagil status, as well as immature or mature status, whether it's in the data set or not. In our case, the data set only includes adults, so we're limited to these stages here, dormant through extra large. And then what the size classes are. Here we're using counts of sprouts. So the actual sizes, size bin center, are typically going to be integers. But 
Um, these size classes, we created them because this is a raw matrix, of course, and so we need to have um, a biologically realistic life history model, but also one that doesn't have so many stages that, <clears throat> that we're missing data uh, going through them in any given year. So in this case, the small um, individuals are actually, um, one, are actually two or three sprouts, whereas the extra small are just a single sprout. And so here we get a, under the comments, we see good you know, disc descriptions of what these stages are. Extra small adults or a single shoot, small adults two to three, medium four to five. And then here, verticalized three. So if I go to the help file, verticalize three, you can get a sense of what this does. But this takes our data set and turns it into historical vertical format. So it takes each individual's data breaks it up into three consecutive times and then makes a row for each of those set of three. To do this, we have to put in a lot of data. We have to, we have to put in the actual name of the data set itself, how many years we have or, or time steps, uh, I'm sorry, times. The first year or the first time, the name of it. And we have whether there's a variable in there identifying patch, in this case there is and it's called patch, another one for individual identity, which is important the size of each repeated block for each year, which is four columns in this case. And then what the different size terms are that you can input up to three different size variables. So we have size A, size B, and size C. Reproductive status is given by two different variables here. So um, repster A and repster B give the two different reproductive columns. And then fecundity is given by the pod column. A pod is a, an orchid fruit. It's, uh, it basically holds typically several thousand dust seeds and there's only one of those. We wanted to assign the stages according to the stage frame that we created. Be careful, make sure your stage frame includes all sizes observed in the data set. There's, there's no question about something, you know, an individual that had some size that doesn't um, fall within the stage frame. And we want um, our size to be calculated as the sum of these three. So we say that stage size is actually equal to size added. And we have to tell R how to interpret, um, first of all, NAs within the, da the data set. And our, our, in my case, because of how I build the data set, I want NAs to be interpreted as zeros, um, particularly within size and fecundity. And then how should non-reproductive individuals be treated? So uh, an individual with a fecundity of zero, so that, should that still be included as, or categorized as a reproductive individual? In this case, we haven't separated out flowering individuals from non-flowering, so the answer is yes. So you have to mark that as true. So we run that. And we could do a little summary um, showing what it looks like. And what you'll notice when you start looking through here, you see initially, a few columns just identifying each individual and where it came from and the year, a few extra little things that'll estimate things like the observed age and the observed lifespan of the individual when it was first seen, when it was last seen. And then you reach this area that's repeated, size A all the way through um, stage one index. So these are all the one, right? Stage A1, stage B1, and so uh, size A1, size B1 and so forth. And then it repeats with size A2. The ones that are marked with a one are for time at t minus one. Uh, the ones that are marked with two correspond to time t. And the ones that are marked with three correspond to time t plus one. Okay. Some of you do not organize your data as I do. <clears throat> and that's okay, we can work with that. So I've worked with a lot of demographers and I'm rather used to this. And so I actually built some functions that can work with just about all the different data sets you've got. I also include within LeftCo3 a vertical version of the SIP data set. So here's SIPVirt. Let me show you what SIPVirt looks like. Um, many demographers basically go out there and what they'll do when they're monitoring their populations is they'll mark the individual identity, uh, what year it is, and then they'll just write the status and that's a single row and then move on to the next row. And so they'll just keep on adding rows. Sometimes because they might wanna create a matrix projection model, they might add two consecutive years in each line and repeat you know, whatever the year T plus one is as the year T later on. You can use this format as well. In that case, so 
you'll notice that the dimensions of the two data sets are very different, right? So the original data set we were looking at that was horizontal was 77 rows and 27 columns. Whereas this vertical data set is 331 rows and only 12 columns. We have a different function to handle this, which is historicalize three, okay? And so this takes a vertical data set and turns it into this historically formatted version. And we have a similar sort of um, you know, naming system here. Now, one thing just to bear in mind is that if, if you're looking at the old um, methods in ecology and evolution supplements, then some of the, the terminology for this has slightly changed because I wanted more consistency between historicalized three and verticalized three. So just be careful with that. The old terminology, I think in verticalized three doesn't work anymore. But we can run this. In both cases, historicalized and verticalized allow you to add some other things too. I just want you to be aware of them, particularly for example, if you have environmental or individual covariates, you can make them as columns within your data set and it'll incorporate them, okay? So it'll put them into that data set. You can model them later on if you want. If you have anything in your data set that actually tells for certain whether an individual is alive, dead, observed, not observed, you know, and so forth, you can actually mark those as well. And so just put in the column name or the column number for that. Now, so we've created CIPRA v1, CIPRA v2. Do they look the same? If so, then they have the same dimensions and they do. 320 rows, 54 columns. Now we're gonna build a, um, a raw matrix here. And so I wanna show you how that works. First, we're, we're gonna have to do is build what's known as a reproductive matrix, just to show our, how reproduction works, what sorts of transitions within the matrix those are gonna be composed as. Um, it could be that you have a special case where there are several reproductive classes and maybe there are several juvenile classes that reproduction can lead to. You can specify that. And what you do is you create a zero matrix that's, that has the same number of rows and columns as your stage frame has stages. And then you identify the transitions um, corresponding to fecundity within there as if it were a normal matrix projection model, except just specify ones to keep whatever R estimates to be the fecundity is equal, or if you want to split things, you can split it across two different rows, for example, by, by putting in 0.5. In this case, um, reproduction can lead to dormant seeds or it can lead to protocorms. So we're going to split fecundity between the two rows. So we're going to identify those at 0.5. So I can run SIP, uh, rep SIP raw now to show you what that looks like. This is the reproductive matrix, right? We have 11 stages. It's only these um, five last adult stages that can produce any, any kind of offspring and they'll be either dormant seed in the first row or first year protocorms. Now, one of the really powerful things about LEFCO3 is it allows you to actually fit in um, given or proxy transitions. So if you have literature that you know, estimates certain transitions that you think are better than your own study, you can use them. Or if you think that there are certain transitions that should be equal to things that are estimable in your data set, you can set those. In our case, um, so for example, with the ahistorical uh, matrix projection model, we basically aren't working with any juvenile classes and we don't know germination. So we have to use other literature for that. So the probability of, of maintaining a dormant seed is given as 0.1. That's this given right here. So dormancy to dormant seed is 0.1. We could do that with all sorts of transitions. And we can also set proxy transitions. So for example, the transition from a seedling to a dormant stage. Well, we don't know what seedlings are doing, but we can assume that maybe that's similar to the transition from an extra small adult to a dormant stage. So we'll set that up using the S stage that sets it up as a proxy, okay? And then this type here that tells R that these are all survival transitions. The other option is fecundity transitions. So, so we'll run this. This is for the ahistorical matrix projection model. And this is for the historical. So here's stage one, time of T minus one, we have to include that as well in order for it to work. Now here, what we can do is we can run a test of history. I'm not going to run this right now. This runs model search, which is used to estimate vital rates, but you can run this to essentially test whether or not any of your vital rates is influenced by size or reproductive status in time T minus one. Okay, I'll show you how it works when we get to the function-based NPMs. But now all we'll do is we'll build our NPMs. This is a raw matrix. There's a special function to create an ahistorical matrix projection model, which is RLF code two. We fit in the data that we're using. 
and the stage frame, you have to put those in. If you want just some of the years that you're working with, you know, to be estimated, or you know, you can write the, the names of those years, you could put all here for all. Uh, we have several patches in the data set, so I'd like R to estimate matrices for all of those. And then um, there are some default for what the stages are in the columns and sizes and things, but uh, I have to overwrite those defaults in this case. So I'm telling R to use these two stage columns and the, the, these two size columns. What the rep matrix is, the reproductive matrix, what the override information is, where the year column is, there has to be a time column. Okay. Um, in this case, I wanted to divide by patches, so I have to tell R what the patch column identity is. And individual identity should be specified usually. Um, in the case of a raw matrix, it doesn't really matter that much, but for function-based matrices, it does. So we'll run this, <clears throat> it runs very quickly. And you can take a look at the summary just to see what it outputs. So in that tiny amount of time, it created 15 full projection matrices, as well as 15 survival transition and 15 fecundity matrices associated with them. Each is a square matrix with 11 rows and columns or 121 elements. Um, on average, there's about 19 L L survival transition elements estimated per matrix and 4.4 fecundities. We can take a little look at what the, these matrices look like. You can see yeah, there's a fair number of zeros here because our data is actually fairly small. Um, Let's create our historical model. So here we're going to use RLEFCO3. We always have to make sure to add in variables corresponding to time t minus 1 in all cases. But everything else here is essentially the same as the previous case. We run this. Doesn't take very long at all. You will see that now we have 12 matrices. In the previous case, it was 15. But that's because um, you can estimate ahistorical matrices using only two consecutive times, but you need three for the historical case. So here it'll, it'll cut down on, um, there, there, let me see, there are five time steps here and three patches. So basically it's gonna cut one of those time steps off and yield four estimable time steps per patch or 12 matrices. The matrices have 121 rows and columns or 14,641 elements of which only 36 survival transitions are estimated on average per matrix and only about six fecundities. You can take a look at what the matrices look like. This is just a, a slice of it because these matrices are a little too big to show. You'll notice these are amazingly sparse matrices. Okay? Historical matrices are usually sparse and when they're raw, they're even sparser. Okay, we can estimate uh, a mean. So mean matrices would be that here. And so this is the mean a historical matrix. This is an arithmetic uh, element wise mean. We could do the same with our historical model. You know, most of that's much sparse. This is just a, a slice of it. And we can take a look at what our uh, historical stages are. There's 121 stage pairs. So we can take a look at what the pairings are. So you can see, you know, when you're looking at the matrices, what are the transitions that you're, that you're looking at going through. This tells you stage at time t minus one and t or t and t plus one, depending on whether you're looking at columns or rows. You can do a little test on yourself by running the column sums for the survival transition matrices that pop out. Those are the U matrices. Um, those should be survival probabilities, so they should range from zero to one. If you see something else, there's something wrong. In that case, please let me know. Now, uh, we have the ability to do some analyses here. So let's take a look at the deterministic population growth rate and plot it out annually and see if there are any differences. So you'll notice um, we have very, very high, uh, I'm sorry, not very high, but uh, we, we have a population growth rate typically of about one in 2006, seven and eight, but there's strong deviations before that, right? Um, so A, B and C here correspond to the three patches that I mentioned. And you see that um, the historical model seems to be estimating a lower population growth rate in this case than the ahistorical model um, for those for two of those. We can look at lambda for the means just to compare. Um, so this is showing us patch level and then the overall population mean. So one, two, and three correspond to patch A, B, and C. And the overall population mean for the ahistorical model is 0.932. 
Whereas for the historical model, it's much more different. This is because these matrices are so sparse. Raw matrices can lead to strong variability depending on how you do them. So these are the patch level matrices, which once again differ in a lower historical lambda. We can estimate our stable stage structure in a historical versus historical formats. And you'll see that they're quite different actually. Uh, the a historical model gives a stronger emphasis on the dormant seeds and, and the uh, pro first year protocorms. Whereas the historical model shows that this class seven, this is the one sprouted adult is, is much, much more uh, a dominant part of the stable stage structure. We can look at the reproductive values for the a historical versus historical case. And here we see strong differences again, um, particularly in the historical case, we see that once again, those extra small individuals are really important. And all the other ones are more important than the a historical case. We can do a sensitivity analysis. And so this is showing us in the, um, so in the a historical matrix, what the greatest what the, uh, what the transition is with the greatest sensitivity value. This is the full historical matrix. And then there, it also actually estimates a historically corrected uh, normal matrix. So we have an 11 stage, um, stage frame. So this historically corrected matrix would be 11 by 11, but with the sensitivities corrected for history. And we see that there's a small difference here in the element that's most important. Um, now I'm not gonna go any further with the sensitivities, but the elasticities are a little bit interesting. I'll show you that analysis. This is gonna spit out similar sorts of things. Once again, we have a different sort of elasticity value coming out in the historical versus a historical case. The nice thing about the elasticities is we can sum them and plot them to compare. So we can compare a historical versus historical elasticities. And you'll notice that <clears throat> Lambda in the a historical case is kind of equally um, affected by changes in extra small, small, medium, and large adults. But in the historical case, the extra small individuals are far more important to Lambda. So this is a really interesting difference and it can show you why historical matrices you know, are, are important to look at. You can sometimes get very different results even in these deterministic analyses. Now, I just wanna introduce very briefly the function-based version of this. So I'm just gonna clear out input here. This is using the same data set, okay, but creating a function-based matrix. You can create an IPM this way, um, and there's a vignette for doing that. But in this case, a superpedian candidum, because we're dealing with count data, that, that doesn't really yield an IPM. Uh, you need a size to be Gaussian for an IPM to work, so it has to be a continuous metric. Let me just show you quickly how this works. We're going to build, you know, the initial bit is going to be the exact same as in the raw case, except that now because we're dealing with function-based models, we don't have to care so much about how much data we have. And so we can build a much bigger stage frame. So this stage frame has the initial juvenile stages all the same, and it has dormancy the same, but then it splits the adult uh, life cycle into non-flowering or vegetative versus flowering. So that's the V's versus the F's. And we can do a stage for every sprout. So one, two, three, four, all the way up to 24, which is the greatest number of sprouts here. So this stage frame, we're gonna build like that, right? So we're gonna run this. We're gonna add these descriptions for all the different stages. This is very useful just so that we know what we're doing. And then I'm gonna show you that looks like, right? So it's a much bigger stage frame, but it's quite useful. And the size is in particular very important, whether or not they're reproductive or not. It's also going to be very important and differ. We're going to use, uh, it doesn't matter which data set we use. I just have a tendency to use the horizontal data set and verticalize it. So that's the same as before. We have a different stage frame now. So the stages are called according to that stage frame, the new one. We can take a look at the distribution of sizes, which should match what we saw before. The x-axis here is kind of low res, so we can zoom in on it a little bit. And we see that most of our individuals were size one or two. We can take a look once again at, uh, we can take a look at um, the fecundity. Fecundity is actually given as a count variable as well. And so we might wanna just take a look and see um, what it looks like. And it turns out that it's strongly weighted to just a single uh, fruit or zero. 
because we want to build a function-based matrix projection model, we have to estimate our vital rates. Our vital rates are going to be estimated as linear models, right? So the survival probability is going to be a linear model. Sprouting, which is given as observation status, that's going to be a model. Size transition will be a model. Reproductive status will be a model. And fecundity. We have to know what the underlying distributions should be for size and fecundity. They're count-based, so you might be inclined to say, well, there should be Poisson. But the Poisson distribution has a number of assumptions. And the SF distrib function allows us to test those um, assumptions. The first assumption that gets tested in each case is whether or not the mean is equal to the variance, which is required for the Poisson distribution here. Mean size is three, variance in, in size is 12. Probability of that dispersion level happening by chance is zero. <laughs> So size is significantly dispersed. And when we look at fecundity down here, we see the same sort of thing. Fecundity is significantly over dispersed. Another assumption is that the number of zeros in the data set matches expectation. There's a predicted number of zeros. Now in the case of size, it turns out that the number of zeros sort of matches what our expectation. So there's no zero inflation required. But fecundity turns out to have many more zeros than is expected. And so fecundity is significantly zero inflated. So what this means is that we need to model size and fecundity with negative binomial distributions. And in the fecundity case, it has to be a zero inflated negative binomial because then the mean and the variance are allowed to differ. We're gonna build a reproductive matrix just as before here. It's gonna be much bigger though, because there are 54 stages. We're going to create our overwrite model, just as before. We'll just create the one in this case. We don't have to create both. Now, the key difference here is going to be that we're going to use model search to build our vital rates. Now, when I run this, um, this statement, this is going to take a little while. Maybe in this case, if you run it with full, it depends on what computer you're using, how much power it has. Um, <clears throat> this could take maybe 10 minutes. We don't have that kind of time. So I, I did this and saved it beforehand. So I'm just going to load that. Okay. And we'll take a look at a summary of it. What model search did is it built global models for each of the vital rates that I wanted estimated. And I told it what those global models should be. And then it built all nested, all possible nested models within that. And then it compared them and found the one that was either going to have the lowest AICC or if there was a model with fewer parameters within two AICC units of that lowest AICC model, then it would choose that as the best fit model. You can change that behavior if you want. What did it find? Survival is given, uh, survival is determined here by size and time t. It turned out that size and time t minus one didn't matter. Reproductive status didn't matter. Uh, observation status of sprouting probability in time t plus one is given by size time t. The year and end of ID, so these are corresponding to time and individual identity, and these are random terms. What's interesting is that size, right, is, is so this is a negative binomial distribution underlying it, and it's determined in the best fit case by reproductive status in times t and t minus one, as well as size in those, as well as their two-a interactions. Finally, reproductive, well, not finally, but reproductive status in time t plus one is determined by reproductive status and size in time t. And fecundity is a zero inflated negative binomial mixed model uh, where both the normal count um, model as well as the zero inflation model are determined. Uh, so fecundity in time two is given by size in time two as well as your individual identity. We have a little bit of extra um, information, how many models were actually tested. Notice that the zero inflation resulted in many more models being tested of fecundity because two global models, we started with two global models, one for the count term and one for the, for the uh, binomial um, model of zero. And then, uh, so we have a little cheat sheet as to what uh, each term means in our model. And we have a little bit of quality control information. Survival is estimated with our data set. 74 individuals and 320 individual transitions. Then we subset that to get the observation probability and size and so forth. You can take a look at the model table if you want. This shows that um, it, with the best fit model at the top and I'm scrolling down. All right, so these are all the different parameters tested in each model. 
We can run a uh, model search on the A historical version as well. We just create a, a new uh, left go mod structure where historical equals false and everything else is the same. And so then we get to the NPM estimation. I'm just going to run um, the historical one because it's, uh, so there's some interesting things that happen as a result of this. So let me run that. So the actual um, algorithm that's happening here is a little different because it's using the vital rate models to populate the historical matrices. So it'll have many more matrix elements estimated than in the raw case. So we still have, uh, so we, we have in this case, because our um, stage frame has 54 stages, we have 54 squared columns and 54 squared rows. So 2,916 rows and columns, a total of 8,503,056 elements. In each case, 117,712 survival transitions were estimated and 2,592 fecundities. We can take a look at what those look like. So these are these are still very sparse matrices, but more of them are estimated than in the raw case. Okay. We can take a look at what the, the mean looks like. So that's over here. And we can proceed and basically go on and do all the same sorts of analyses that we did in the raw case, except with function-based. Okay. And so if you follow through with this vignette and go to the end of it, then you'll you'll see. You know, you get an interesting analysis and with some different inferences because we, we've modeled the life history differently. Okay, well, I hope that this helps uh, everyone in terms of uh, starting with LeftCo3. If you have any questions, please email me at um, cdorm at g.ecc.u, tokyo.ac.jp. That is the official email for the maintainer site. Um, and um, you know, send me your comments, questions. If you have any problems, um, if you find a bug or something, uh, please let me know. I'm always very happy to help. And um, good luck and um, happy hunting.